And I'll retweet it right when right when you put it out. Thank you. Whoa, that's not what I meant to do. <laughs> okay. Neat. Oh, there we go. Okay. So we should be live. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's January 14th, Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. My name is Laura Webb, and uh, Tyler is my co-host. And tonight we are with Mark Dwyer. He is the director of rehab at Olympia Medical Center here in Kansas City. And we are talking about administration in physical therapy practice. So thank you very much for joining well, us sure. tonight. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so first, do you want to introduce yourself to our audience so that we have a little bit of an idea of your background and okay. where you're coming from? I'm a physical therapist and have been one since 1987. Graduated from KU Medical Center, same place Laura goes to school. Uh, I've worked in uh, hospitals my entire career. Uh, I'm now the director of rehab services at Olathe Medical Center here in Olathe, Kansas. And Outside of that, I'm also an adjunct instructor at two of the DPT programs here in town, and I'm a former Kansas chapter president and currently the chief delegate for the Kansas KBTA chapter. And then last thing, uh, which is something new in the last couple of years, is I also sit on the board of directors for a local 112-bed nursing home, which has been a big learning experience, uh, getting into long-term care from that perspective. Mm -hmm. So um, we've seen that, obviously, Medicare, uh, CMS, is really trying to cut down on fraud um, in terms of just saving money for taxpayers. Um, how big of an issue is this for newcoming uh, physical therapists? And are they, um, how, how will they encounter this when they first start practicing? Well, first off, I think it's important that we all understand that it's a problem out there. There's a good resource that actually Laura showed me on the APTA website today where there's a statistic on there that the Institute of Medicine estimates that $765 billion of the about $3 trillion that we spend on health care is fraud, waste, and abuse. And when I saw that, I knew that it was a high number, but it was just an incredible number. And they estimate that about $75 billion of that is actual fraud. And the federal government realizes that they can they can recoup some of that money. So they are trying to do that through numerous avenues, including prosecution. So I think it's important that all of us understand what fraud is and, and how to avoid it and how to spot it. Because it's it's all we're all responsible for this. It's our profession at stake here. And and we're all professionals. It's so we have to make sure and and find it and root it out whenever we can. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, and I was actually, when I was reading up in preparation for this interview, I think in, in some cases they were saying fines of three times of what the estimated mm -hmm. uh, fraud amount was that was supposed to be going through CMS. Would it be an actual, the actual fine amount? Right. Well, uh, Medicare fraud is prosecuted under the Civil False Claims Act. And the penalties for that are $5,500 to $11,000 per claim, and then triple damages based on how much you bill the government. So that can lead to fines in the millions of dollars. And, and it's not very hard. You can go to the Department of Justice website and search physical therapy fraud and find all kinds of cases where physical therapists and or facilities have been prosecuted by the government had to pay multi-million dollar fines, and in some cases they actually had to serve jail time because the Civil False Claims Act is both a criminal act and uh, a civil act, and so there, there could be jail time. So the, the consequences can be severe. 
So what would the process be in terms of if fraud is suspected, how would how would that manifest in terms of someone getting in trouble and that being found out? Well, there's many different ways that Medicare can find out about fraud. There, there's all different types of Medicare groups that is that looks at our billing. And those groups can report you to Medicare. Uh, and there is a group out there called the ZPIC, Z-P-I-C. Uh, they audit Medicare charts and, and claims, and they specifically look for fraud. If a recovery audit contractor is looking at you and, and, and they, they identify some patterns that they think could possibly be fraudulent, it's okay for them to report you to the ZPIC, and then the ZPIC can take another look at it. And then if, depending on what they find, they may report you to the state prosecutor or to whoever would be prosecuting your jurisdiction. So that's one way. Another way is your patient may call because there's a reward if a patient turns you in and you get fined and, and you're found guilty. So there are ways to do that. And there's also whistleblower, it's called TTAM lawsuits, such that an employee can also report an organization or a therapist, and if the federal government enjoins them in that lawsuit, and the person ends up being or getting convicted, then the first the whistleblower can get up to 25 to 30 percent of the settlement. And there have been people that have gotten tens of millions of dollars from key TAM settlements. So, so there's all kinds of people looking at this. Your patient is looking at it. Your, your coworker or your employee, if you're a supervisor or manager, could be looking at it. And you know Medicare is looking at it. So that, I don't know how common, that was news to me that uh, there's incentives for patients to, or, or anybody who's a patient of, or knowledgeable of a practice that might be fraudulent, mm -hmm. that they could um, get a reward, essentially, for being a, a whistleblower. Or, um, it's a hotline on the Medicare website. Yeah, very easy to find. Well, Mark, I have a follow-up question. That um, one of the more common infractions that um, are reported or or turned in or seen in relation to our practice. Yes. Yeah. Well, since we bill using the CPT codes, and we're primarily probably talking about Medicare Part B side here. So on the Part B side, it's going to be how we bill. If you're billing for a service that you didn't provide, and you may sit there and think, well, who's going to bill for a service they didn't provide? Well, go to the Department of Justice website, and you can find some. And I've got the articles, too, and I'm sure others can, can get those for you as well. That type of fraud really does occur out there. It's unfortunate, but it does occur. So that's one, is just billing for something you didn't need to do. Another one could be intentionally billing incorrectly. And I say intentionally because to prove Medicare fraud, you have to have acted intentionally. So abuse is considered kind of ignorant mistakes. You, you should have known how to do it, but you didn't, and you were doing it wrong. So the penalties might not be quite as bad, but okay. fraud is intentional. Okay. So, I think it's good to separate those terms. So abuse yeah. being where you may not have known that you were doing something wrong, right. and that's important for us as students to know that. Even right. if we don't maybe know that what we're doing is a fraudulent practice that we can still get, right. we're definitely not exempt from that. And, and yeah, I, I, I don't know all the case law and everything, but my, I would venture a bet that if, if you're found to be you know, abusing, ab abusive of, of something, of doing something wrong, you might have to pay a fine, but you probably wouldn't go to jail because they know you didn't intend to do it. Right. Uh, just keep up well enough with the regulations. That, that makes sense. Um, my original undergraduate is in uh, criminal justice and intent. I remember them speaking very, very heavily to intent. Uh, uh, not knowing is not necessarily an excuse to, to break the law, but intent um, is, is, is taken into account when it comes to punishments, usually. So I guess that plays out here as well. Yeah, exactly. Well, and there's a good example in the, in the resource that we told you about on the APTA website that talks about fraud and abuse in relation to physical therapy practice. Uh, they actually gave a couple of examples where one guy just got fined, but another guy went to jail for nine years. So and paid a fine. So again, it just it just shows you the it can be criminal and civil as far as the penalties go. 
but it's not always uniform, of course. And so the distinction there be more in terms of length of, I'm assuming that would have to do with length of time of the fraud, yeah. repetitions of it, or documentation of intent, or something like that, where it appeared that the person knowing it was doing something wrong and was continuing to do so anyway. Yeah, I would assume so. Yeah, the length of time is probably going to play into it. And, and also, how much did you build a government for that was incorrect? Whether, again, it was abusive or, or, or true fraud. Because, again, the, the fine is going to be based on how many claims you submitted to the government. So if you submitted 10,000 claims that were all wrong, at $5,500 to $11,000 per claim, that can add up. But if you only did 100 of them wrong before you got caught, then the memory um, I wanted to ask a little bit about some of the patterns. You've mentioned that recovery audit contractors mm -hmm. are able to look at certain patterns mm -hmm. in billing. What are things that they would be looking for? I mean, we, we don't know for sure because the, the recovery auditors haven't necessarily come out and told us, hey, we're looking for this. Mm -hmm. But as far as recovery audit contractors go, they do have to get approval from Medicare of what they audit before they can audit it. And then that gets posted on the recovery auditor website. So if, if you're curious, well, what are they looking at in relation to physical therapy? You can go out and look at it. I look at it three times or four times a year, every quarter. And now that you just have to keep in mind, the list is the entire list of what they look for in all of healthcare. So you have to go through and figure out which ones apply to physical therapy and which don't. But one of the very first things that the recovery auditor started looking for when that program was initiated in 2010 was billing for more than one unit per day for an untimed CPT code. And for untimed CPT codes like PT eval, you could only bill one per day. So that's, that's low-hanging fruit. That's something a computer can look for. Is this an untimed code, and did they bill more than one? Well, ding, 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 there you go. So that's an easy one to look for. Another one that they could possibly be looking for is, you know, if they can see that a, a provider is billing 60 units, 60 timed units per day, or some crazy number like that. And most people probably work an eight-hour day. You know, some therapists may work a 10-hour day, so those numbers would be a lot higher. But when you start getting pretty high, again, it, it may not be that they're doing anything wrong, but it may indicate or may may make them question whether that's the case, and they may take a closer look at it. If it just happens every now and then, then it's fine, no big deal. But if it's happening every single day, then they may start to put two and two together. And so is there, do you feel like, and you mentioned, you know, something outrageous, like billing 60 units a day, and, and it's, I'm currently in, in rotation right now, and I know that's pretty impossible to be able to do in any normal uh, amount of work day. Um, and we also have... I've heard of it happening. I guess if you worked a really long work day, um, but is as a uh, rehab, as an administrator in a hospital, how um, do you, what do you see as something that is reasonable for uh, productivity in terms of a physical therapist, or what kind of ranges would you look at um, in terms of billing uh, for a given, you know, eight hour work day or a 10 hour work day? Well, again, keep in mind I'm talking time codes, because okay. your untimed codes such as uh, you know, a hot pack or unattended e stim or mechanical traction, those types of things. You know, th those can be in addition to, of course. So I'm just talking about the time codes, gait training, manual therapy, therapeutic activities, those mm -hmm. types of things, therapeutic exercise. Well, if you're working an eight-hour day, there's four 15-minute units per hour. So you've got a theoretical maximum there of 32 units per day of time codes. So if you're seeing a whole lot more than 32 time codes per day, then maybe you want to start asking questions. Now, again, maybe they work four 10-hour days during the week. A lot of my therapists work four 10s. So for them, it's 40 units per day. You know, that's if every single patient shows up and, and so on. Now, if you start grouping or dovetailing patients and using the group code, that could change things around a little bit. But, but again, the theoretical maximum is 32 time codes in an eight-hour day. Um, and you mentioned grouping of um, patients. Mm -hmm. What is, and I know this, this might be a little bit more on the controversial side, um, what is the use of 
grouping patients and how, let's see, when is that appropriate and how do you go for that when mm -hmm. you're using more than, when you're treating more than one patient, like one comes in early to right. warm up or something like that, how, what is an ethical way to go about doing that with billing? Well, I think the first thing to say is you know, not all grouping is bad. Sometimes group has this negative connotation. And, and depending on your treatment setting, it may not be something that your clinic wants to do or, or, or it is. You know, different patient populations, some patient populations may actually prefer to be in a group. Maybe if you've got a lot of sports medicine patients, 20-year-old athletes who after ACL reconstruction, they may actually prefer to do rehab together. But maybe a 70-year-old total knee replacement patient, maybe they don't. Maybe they prefer one-on-one. -on -one. So you know, part of it's going to be based on your patient population. But as far as how you bill it, if you're seeing two patients at the same time and billing a timed code to each of them, then that's what should trigger the group code if you're supervising those two patients simultaneously. So that's the key is more two or more patients and simultaneous supervision, and then a third one of timed codes. So if you've got two patients here and one's on mechanical traction, and one you're doing therapeutic exercise with, that's an untimed and a timed code. That's okay. You can still build mechanical traction to that one and therapeutic exercise to this one. But if you've got two patients doing therapeutic exercise at the same time, and you're supervising both of them at the same time, that's what triggers the group code, which is the CPT code 97150. And if that group lasts a half an hour, you have to remember group code is untimed. So you can't build two or three units of it because you did a group for half an hour. You can only build one unit of group code no matter what. If you've got five patients in the pool and you're doing a, a pool group, each patient gets charged one group code for however long you have them grouped together. So that's for the entire session that you're treating that patient then? Can you also do well, untimed codes within that? You can. But it's, it's not necessarily the entire session. It could just be the time that they are dovetailed or that they overlap. Because there's many, there's many different ways to see more than one patient at the same time. You could dovetail them. Or that's what some people call it. When maybe one person comes in at 8 in the morning, and then you have a, and they, they're there until 8, say 8.45. And then your second patient comes in at 8.30. So you're overlapping for 15 minutes. Some, some therapists call that a dovetail. Mm -hmm. You're overlapping 15. So if you're billing find codes, and you're supervising them simultaneously, then you charge the group code for that 15 minutes only. You can still charge the individual codes for the time that you're treating them individually. Right. So it's just that time that they overlap. Now the other thing with group code to think about is, again, the supervision side. So if you've got, say, two patients there at the same time, but you're not supervising them at the same time, then you don't need to use a group code. Some, I've heard some people call this concurrent therapy. Let's say you have a person come in, you have two patients come in, and maybe they're both, say, stroke patients, and they fatigue pretty quickly. So you work with patient one for 10 minutes, and you do, say, therapeutic exercise, and you let that person rest for 10 minutes. And then you go work with patient number two, maybe you do gait training and snare training with them for 10 minutes. And you just go back and forth and back and forth, 10 on, 10 off, 10 on, 10 off. You're not supervising that second patient. So in that case, that doesn't trigger a group change. So at the end, you just add up however many 10 minutes you did with each one, and then, again, if you're talking Medicare patients, you're talking 8.2 minute rule, then you need to figure out how many units you can bill, and then you build the appropriate one. So that's one where you might have two or maybe even three patients there at the same time, but you might not use a group code. Because, it, it, again, it all comes down to the supervision, whether you're supervising or not. So you really have to break down within each uh, session that you're Working, if you are working with multiple patients in order to bill legally for that situation and not right. incur the group code, then you would need to break it down. It's not a whole hour for this person, a whole right. hour for that person, but 30 and 30. Right. Hours it depends on how much they've overlapped and how much the supervision has overlapped. And, and again, keep in mind that group code is a CPT code. It, this isn't just Medicare. Now, Medicare has written some pretty detailed regulations in relation to the group. So we tend to rely on, on, the, on those Medicare definitions because there is more there than what's in the CPT manual. Mm -hmm. But don't forget, we, we bill everybody via CPT code. 
So if you're billing Aetna or Humana or any insurance company and you, you, you've got more than two patients there and you're supervising them simultaneously, you're supposed to be using the group code for them too, not just Medicare patients, because this is a CPT code and your insurance company most likely requires you via your contract to honor the CPT code definitions. So Medicare is really the most stringent of, generally speaking, from what I've, mm -hmm. what I've learned, and then all others need to adhere to just that basic level and then the additional right. level. Well, and, and with the private insurance companies, I, I don't know that we have any here in Kansas City, but I have heard of some around the country that don't pay for the group code. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing to be mindful of. So if you've got a certain insurance company that they don't cover 97150, the group code, then you probably shouldn't be grouping with patients, mm -hmm. at least from that insurance company. Something to think about. Because, again, they're still expecting you to follow the CPT code definition. Whether they pay for it or not is irrelevant you're still supposed to follow the CPT code definition. So if they won't pay for it, that doesn't give you permission to then not have to use the group code. It just means that for that insurance company, they won't cover it. And so is it really up to the physical therapist to go through um, whoever is maybe the billing manager for their, for their company or their organization to really make sure and check that they're following along with each insurer's regulation? Well, that's an interesting question because sometimes I get asked that by students when I, because I teach this stuff in, in the two curriculums and I've taught workshops and everything on this. And, and that's one of the questions that people will ask is, really, do I have to go read all of this stuff? Do I have to read all of our insurance contracts? And, and, and the reality, of, well, uh, I, I guess I would say if, if you want to be 100% sure for yourself, do it. Um, but does, yeah, it's, it's probably pretty rare. You're relying on your supervisor, your manager, your clinic owner, or, or somebody within most likely management to be on top of that and to educate you. So if you've got questions, though, by all means, I would encourage you to ask. Talk to your supervisor. If, if you hear about one of your insurance companies doing something strange, ask about it. You, so many times... I've, I've even and I've been asked by people. So I was in a workshop where I heard this somewhere that this does this company doesn't pay for this, or, this and, 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 or that Medicare requires something that they don't. Require. So if, if it just sounds strange, then ask. So if uh, they go to the, if I were to go to my supervisor, say I'm working somewhere and they don't know the answer to that, where do we go from there? How do you find out the answer to that beyond? It depends on the setting in which you're working. If, if you're working in an institutional environment, like say a hospital or maybe a nursing home that's like a nationwide nursing home company, chances are they have a corporate compliance department. And, and in those large institutional settings, the corporate compliance department, their responsibility is to make sure that that facility and all of its employees follow all the rules of that. Now, they're mainly looking at Medicare. They're not probably going to be looking at your private insurance contract. That might be more of the contracting department and the billing department uh, to make sure you get paid correctly. But the corporate compliance one, that, they're there to keep everybody out of jail. Uh, that's, that's what our corporate compliance chief likes to say right now. But, uh, and so they're, they're a very valuable resource to use. So if, if your supervisor doesn't know, then, then hopefully that person would then go up to corporate compliance. But anybody can talk to corporate compliance. So mm -hmm. I would encourage that. The kicker is, is what if you're maybe in a smaller facility or in a clinic that doesn't have access to a corporate compliance department, then what do you do? And that's where I go. You know, I always say, ding, 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 APTA. And, and that's even true if you are in an institutional setting with a corporate compliance department. That, that's what APTA is partly here for, is, is to help keep all of us out of jail, too. Uh, there are all kinds of resources on the APTA website. We just have to use them. And, and the nice thing about the APTA website is, if you go into the Medicare Benefit Policy Manual, our, our regulations just in that one manual are about 150 pages long for rehab. Who wants to read that? <laughs> you don't look like you're that excited no. to read that. Uh, chances are nobody out there is either. But that's what APTA does for us. They go in there and they find out what do we need to know, and they can summarize it for us. Now, in the end, it's still not a bad thing for everybody to read because Medicare, because they post it out there on the public Internet, they do expect everybody to know it or at least be familiar with it. But that's what APTA can do. They can summarize it and get it to you in a, in a little easier format. Mm -hmm. 
I think since we're talking about the APTA, it would be good to mention the integrity that APTA dot or the choosing wisely. Mm -hmm. Did you want to talk a little bit about that or explain? I what I can bring it up. Yeah, there's a whole lot going on right now with APTA in relation to helping us be better practitioners from this standpoint. Again, as a professional organization, we, we don't want to be committing fraud, and we want to be educating our members on how to avoid that, especially fraud. But abuse is one that's even, it's probably even more of a concern there because that one is people aren't doing things intentionally, they just don't know. So that's just an educational thing. So APTA has, has provided a lot of resources over the last few years helping us to, to figure this stuff out. Uh, there's a few of them out there. You mentioned the uh, Integrity website. Mm -hmm. So if you go onto the APT website and just search for, what's it called? Uh, well, I was looking at uh, Choosing Wisely. Choosing that Wisely. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, a, that's a, a particular program, uh, Choosing Wisely. That's a partnership between the APTA and the American Board of Internal Medicine, ABIM. The ABIM has actually been doing this for a while now, and they've come out with numerous guidelines for physicians. Uh, physical therapists in the APTA, we are the first non-physician group to partner with them to come up with the, the, some things that we shouldn't be doing. Okay. <laughs> uh, so right now we, we have the first five of those, and they, they're on the APTA website. So if you just go to the website and, and just search for Choosing Wisely, then I think that will be the first or second thing that pops up. And the five that are on there now, uh, just to list them out, one is uh, not to use passive uh, physical agents such as hot packs and the like, except when necessary. So, uh, that's a big one that, that our profession has sometimes been criticized for, is that we overuse modalities. Uh, the second one is don't under-prescribe or underdose strength training for our geriatric patients. Uh, the third one is don't recommend bed rest following diagnosis of acute vein thrombosis. Uh, number four is don't use a continuous passive motion machines for total knee replacement patients. And then the fifth is don't use whirlpools for wound management. And if you go to that document, there's a summary document, and then there's all the evidence that backs up all five of those. So, and it's not saying that those things are terrible all of the time. It's just, again, looking at our practice and, and trying to help us practice better and practice by the evidence. So if you haven't looked at that website, I, I highly encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, it's a very interesting partnership, and, and it's probably only going to grow, and I assume other professions are going to get involved with it as well. So how, um, and I know that you yourself aren't directly involved in creating this list right. of five things, but do you have kind of an idea of why they came up with these specific five things, or you know, what, um, where you might imagine to see this list grow, or what other things you might... Yeah, I, I don't know how they came up with it. I, I mm -hmm. assume you know they sat in a room and, and probably brainstormed on what are the things that, that frustrate you or that you don't think is necessary. Like, I'm guessing here. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my guess. And, and then they, they whittled them down and mm -hmm. came to these five. But again, I'm sure they were looking at the evidence, too, and figuring out, because I'm sure somebody said something that bugs them, and the evidence might say, no, that's okay. That, that's good to do. Mm -hmm. But these are the ones that the evidence showed it didn't show strong evidence for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so great resource right there. So again, that was um, integrity.apta.org slash choosing wisely is the website to be able to find that. And just to give you one example with that, I heard of a healthcare facility here in town that one of their orthopedic surgeons was still using CPMs, and the, the, the physical therapy manager brought that to the physician. They talked about it, looked at the resources, and the physician said, well, Okay, I'll stop mm -hmm. using CPM. Cool. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it really does, it, it, it carries mm -hmm. weight. And because it's, it's one, it's coming from physicians as well as therapists, and it's based on the evidence. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important as, as we're promoting our profession as an mm -hmm. evidence based practice and profession, and, you know, working, showing that we're working with physicians mm -hmm. to make ourselves more coming up front with what, what we're doing that does work and what mm -hmm. some may still be doing that may the evidence shows may not work and recognizing that and being forthcoming about that. Right. Well, if, uh, you know, healthcare is a team sport, so mm -hmm. we, we have to partner with other groups and we have to pay attention to what works. 
especially as the evidence is so easy to find now. I mean, it used to be when you had to go to a medical library and search through car catalogs and go hunt down. That, that was. It was hard to find stuff back then. But now, you can, I mean, geez, the world is at your fingertips with Google. Yeah, mm -hmm. not bad. So let's um, switch gears just a little bit, if you don't mind, um, talking about students that may be soon looking for new jobs as an entry level physical therapist. Mm -hmm. What types of things do you recommend that they, if, if, if I'm in an interview with a potential employer, mm -hmm. what kinds of things would I want to ask those, um, those employers during an interview to kind of figure out what the environment of that practice is like and mm -hmm. what, what I can expect? Yeah. You know, first off, be sure when you when you go out for your interviews for your first job after a PT school that you're prepared to ask questions because this is a two-way street finding a job. The facility, like when I, I when I'm interviewing people, I'm trying to find or trying to determine if they're a good fit for our facility and our culture. And you should be doing the exact same thing with us. Are are we a good fit for you and, and your culture, the culture that you're looking for in the clinic? So by all means, be prepared to ask questions. So along these lines, these are just some that, that I recommend to students when they ask me about this. How many visits per day is each therapist expected to see? You know, whether that's an inpatient or an outpatient, skilled nursing, whether it's home health, whether it's school-based, whatever that may be. Because the number of visits per day is going to vary greatly depending on the type of facility. And again, take into account how many hours per day you'd be working. But, but that would give you some indication of that. And again, a high number of visits isn't necessarily bad, depending on how they bill and, 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 and the patient types and, and so on and so forth. But you may have an expectation of how many visits per day you want to be treated. So this would be a, a question to, for you to inform yourself about that. And that might be something really good to keep an eye out on in your clinicals while they're still in school right. to see, you know, asking our CIs about productivity yeah. standards so that we kind of have an idea of how what we're expected to do yeah. at the different sites that we're at so that we kind of know what that feels like for right. different standards. Well, I always encourage students in the classes that I teach. Uh, in, in one of the programs I teach in, I teach this, uh, this class to the second year students, and in the other program is the third year. So when I get those third years, they're, they're pretty much already done with their affiliation for the most mm -hmm. part. But I always recommend to them that when they're out on their affiliations, don't interview the, the supervisor, the manager, the clinic owner, or, uh, whoever you can get a hold of. And, and ask them some of these questions. One, just so you kind of get used to asking questions in, in that type of setting. But again, just like you said, it's, it's good to get perspective. Because you may be in a clinic that you love, and but you may be able to find out some other information about how that clinic runs that way. And, and that could help inform you when you go out and do your interviews later on. From your experience, do you know if there are certain setting types that traditionally are expected to have higher productivity numbers or billing? Units. I, don't, I don't know if that, if, if you know of any trends, or is that going to possibly varies by company? It's going to vary by company. It's going to vary by setting. It's going to vary maybe simply between urban and rural. Yeah. You know, right now, in, in a lot of urban markets, payment for our services is really getting squeezed. But in rural areas, it's not. Not as much anymore. Mm -hmm. So I know a, 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 a PT... He used to be here in town. He ran a private practice. He decided to close the private practice here in Kansas City and move back out to western Kansas. And he said, you know, I don't know how you all survive here on what you're paid by this insurance company. He said, I can make a heck of a lot more out in western Kansas. I even see fewer patients per day. So that's just one example there. So it's kind of hard to say because, you know, there, there are some places where the inpatient hospital, you're seeing... 15 to 20 patients a day. And you may be in an outpatient clinic where you're seeing 15 to 20 patients a day. And then you may be in another hospital where you're seeing eight or nine patients a day. Maybe because you do a lot of ICU care or something where you're complicated patients. Same thing in an outpatient setting. Maybe you're in a clinic that doesn't like to group patients, doesn't like to dovetail, and they see everybody one-on-one. -on -one. So in that case, you're going to see fewer patients a day. But again, it may be a different type of patient that you're seeing there that, that needs more one-on-one -on -one care versus ones that would be better in a group. So those are the types of things you want to try and figure out. If, if you're in an interview and they say, oh, we see 16 to 20 visits a day, 
But maybe the follow-up question to that is, well, what types of patients are they? You know, again, if, if 90% of your caseload is, is post-op sports medicine with young athletes, then that may explain it right there. I doubt you're going to be able to get to 80 year old, or you know, get that many 80 year old Medicare patients after their total knees and they got a bad shoulder or a bad back, doing all that. Mm -hmm. But you could very well do that with the other athlete. So it, it's unfortunately the answer to that is it depends. Mm -hmm. No matter what, say it's okay. <laughs> it's good to know what it depends on so that you can make a more yeah. educated yeah. Uh, follow up question after yeah. that. Well, and. To that point, there, there was actually a motion brought to the APTA House of Delegates this past year in, in 2014 to look at productivity. And we realized as we debated that motion that there's no way you can come up with one productivity standard across every setting in which we can work and every circumstance and every type of patient. So what we decided on instead is that we directed the APTA and the Board of Directors to come up with educational tools so that physical therapists can become better informed on what goes into productivity calculations. So that if they do, or if, if they're told of a productivity standard that they feel is too high, that if, if they take advantage of some of these resources that APTA is going to be developing, then they'll be better able to engage in that discussion with either the clinic director or the owner, or maybe it's the finance people who are demanding this. And you have to be able to speak that language with them. So that, that's part of what this education will do, is just to help you engage in that discussion a little more. Because most of us as PTs, we're not trained as business people. We don't understand all the financial mm -hmm. side of it. So it sometimes be hard to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. One of the other right. questions are, oops, sorry. I heard you mention that you teach in multiple programs. Yes. Do you have any thoughts on how PT programs overall are doing with including this information in the curriculums? Well, I think the two I teach in are doing pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess lecture in, in well, at KU there, so I, I know they do a fair amount there, too. I, I don't have a good feel for how every program is doing it across the country. And, and to be honest, I don't know what CAPTI, the Commission for Accreditation of Physical Therapy Education, I don't know what their requirements are for, for this content. So each program does it a little bit differently. But I've heard from a, a lot of different people around the country that, that this content is in programs, but I, I don't know the extent that it across the entire country. But I believe, at least just based on what I've heard, that we're starting to see more of this education going on in the curriculum, just because there's so much more emphasis being put on it by the regulatory agencies and, and even by clinics themselves. They're expecting students to come out with at least some knowledge of this stuff. They won't be experts. Uh, that's what I always tell the students in my class. I don't expect you to walk out of here and be an expert and stuff, but, to, but you need to at least have some understanding of what's going on. The analogy I use is, is, is you know, if you don't learn any of this stuff, it's like you're driving down the highway, but you won't turn your head. You, you only look straight ahead. You won't know if there's somebody coming at you from the side, and that could be a new statute or a new Medicare rule or reg that you don't know about. And so the, the, my, my goal with the class is just to give them some awareness of all the legal aspects of care, Medicare rules and regs, how payment works, you know, what, what, what does one form of payment versus another form of payment, what, what incentives does that, or disincentives does that create for you as a therapist? Just to give you some awareness of what's going on around you as you're taking care of the patient. Uh, some of the other questions I recommend that students ask is, how many units per day is each therapist expected to go? You know, again, if, 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 you're, if you're told it's 50 or 60, then that, that can trigger some more questions there. Another question is, do you use the Medicare 8 to 23 minute rule for all patients or only for Medicare Part B patients? So some clinics have adopted the Medicare 8 to 23 minute rule for everybody, just because it's easier. So you don't have to try and keep all these different things in mind. Because it is somewhat different than, than just straight CPT code code. So that would be one. Uh, how do you typically schedule patients? Do you allow dovetailing? Do you allow double booking, triple booking, those types of things? Just, again, so that you know how they tend to do things. Do you use the group code when seeing more than one patient at a time? Now, again, like I said before, that will depend on how they're supervised and everything. But if you're told that yes, you know, therapists typically see more than one patient at a time, 
But if you ask this question, they go, oh, no, we never use a group code. Okay, well, that, that might raise some questions. Like, oh, okay, how do you do that? Our patients build one-on-one -on -one time when performing unsupervised tasks, such as riding a bike in the corner for 15 minutes if the therapist is, say, in a treatment room with the door shut, when they're not supervising that patient. Because both the CPT code manual and the Medicare rules and regs say you can only bill for active face-to-face -face time. So that would be that would be one you can find out. And then I also have some questions for PTAs and technicians. And those types. That actually was, uh, as soon as you started talking about the, the, the idea of asking about, okay, do you use group codes for when you're uh, scheduling more than one patient at a time, how does the use of text play into that, and what is legally appropriate for the use of text in the clinic? Technicians are aides. Uh, the first place to go in relation to this question is your State Practice Act. Because in some states, the, the Physical Therapy Practice Act itself prohibits allowing technicians or aides to do billable services. So, you know, they can pick up the clinic and they can prepare things and, and bring patients back, but they can't actually perform a billable service. And it's very explicit in some of those practice acts. But there are many practice acts that are silent to them. They don't say yes or no. And then there are some, like, like our practice act in Kansas, where we've got some language in there, but it leaves some wiggle room. So, so that's the first place to go. Because if your state practice act doesn't allow you to, to allow them to do billable activities, then you're done right there. Even if your insurance companies would pay for it and the like, it doesn't matter. Your practice act is the most restrictive, and it says no. But if your practice act allows that, then, then you're going to fall back to your private insurance company contracts and Medicare rules and regs. Now, Medicare, on the Part B side, is very explicit. No technicians or aides. Actually, if you're not a PT or a PTA, you're not, you can't bill for those services. So aides are considered to be anybody other than a PT or a PTA, which is, uh, could be, again, an unlicensed person, or it could be an athletic trainer. It could be an exercise physiologist. Now, physicians can, can bill for our services, so they wouldn't be considered tax aid. But... But anybody other than a PT or a PTA is considered an aid in a PT plan of care under Medicare Part B. So, uh, so if you're dealing with a private insurance company that, that does allow it and does pay for it, or maybe your contract doesn't say they don't, then, then it's going to have to be up to you as the therapist to figure out, is this an appropriate delegation or not? And is it something that a therapist should be doing, or is it something that, that can be delegated? Yeah, the, way, the way that our practice acts does it in Kansas is that a uh, support person, what we call a support person, which be a tech or an aide, can, can't perform services if it requires the skill and training of, of a PT or a PTA. So again, that's a little nebulous mm -hmm. because the skill and training, uh, yeah, that's everything you know, what that we do. So that one's a little tricky. So some of us, like for me, the way I interpret that in my clinic is techs and aides can't do any billable services. And that's, that's the way we operate. But, but that's my interpretation of that particular statute and regulation. Mm -hmm. what, was a, um, what should a physical therapist do if they find themselves in that situation? They go through the interview process and they find that perhaps the tech is doing more than what they are comfortable with or what they understand their interpretation of the law to be. Right. Well, that, that, I think that's just something that they, they file away or they write down in their notes in the interview, and, and that goes into them making their decision about whether they want to work in that particular place. Mm -hmm. you know, again, that, that decision is always going to be for both me as the person who's interviewing you and, and you as the person who, who are considering taking a job to my clinic. It's always a, a kind of gut decision. Nobody's got all the data to make the best decision. Right? And so what, what makes you comfortable, what makes you uncomfortable? If you're uncomfortable about a situation, then that may be one to avoid. Again, it, it's going to be what you feel comfortable with. Um, <clears throat> but again, you, you need to know what's legal in the state first. So if, if, you're, if, if you're in a curriculum now, or maybe you, you've gone over the Practice Act in that state a little bit, but you're going to be moving to another state, like you, I think. You're going to be moving to Iowa here? Yes. <laughs> Man, you're going to lose it. Uh, then 
you know, the first thing you should do before you go out on interviews in Iowa is you should read the Iowa Practice Act and the Iowa Rules and Regulations for Physical Therapy. And that will inform you when you go into some of the places that you interview. Right. Yeah, help you there. Because what we do in Missouri and Kansas is irrelevant in Iowa. Well, some of the questions I, I recommend when you're talking about this particular issue is, uh, do you have therapists bill for services provided by non-therapists, such as AIDS or techs? Again, it's not necessarily saying it's, it's bad. It's just, again, it's going to depend on the situation and what they're doing. So that, again, can lead to a follow-up question if the answer is yes. Well, what are they doing? How often are they doing it? Uh, uh, who decides whether care is delegated to PTAs? Or if, if they tell you techs and AIDS, then who decides whether care goes there? Is it an automatic one? Say every patient you evaluate gets moved over to a PTA. You know, again, that you'll have to decide is that is that a practice I'm comfortable with, or do I want to make the decision as the evaluating PT if this is where I, or this is a patient that I can delegate? Is there an expectation that a certain number of patients will be delegated to PTAs no matter what? Mm -hmm. if, if it's a practice that maybe has just a few PTs and a whole lot of PTAs. You know, you do have to keep shifting people over to keep the PTAs busy. So, so there may be some type of expectation there. Mm -hmm. And then the last one that I always recommend is when delegation to PTAs occurs, what's the procedure for therapist supervision of those PTAs? How are they communicating with them? How often? In what form? Uh, are, are, they, are they communicating about the, the status of the patient that they progress with the care? Mm -hmm. So those are really good questions for if you're in an interview just to get a better idea of mm -hmm. kind of what kind of environment you might be getting into with mm -hmm. a new job that you're considering taking. And personally, I'm always impressed when I get questions like this. Mm -hmm. Because it tells me, one, they're informed, and, and two, they're sincere about making a good decision about whether this is the right place for them or, or whether maybe it's not. Mm -hmm. And so I, I like it when I see questions like this. It, mm -hmm. If you ask these types of questions and the person you're asking them to, if they start to feel threatened or if you can tell that you know, they're not real happy that you asked that question, in my opinion, that's kind of a sign right there as well. And But again, each situation is going to be a little different there. You're going to have to judge that. But, mm -hmm. but nobody should be afraid of these questions. These, mm -hmm. these, are, these are questions we all should be able to answer. Mm -hmm. um, so just a couple other questions related to uh, students in terms of getting a better idea of, of how to anticipate a practice environment. Mm -hmm. um, is there um, a way that, say that someone finds himself in a situation where they do suspect broader abuse, mm -hmm. would they, um, how are they is there a certain amount of time in which they need to report something like that that's going on that is fraudulent, that they suspect is fraudulent, or how is that process? As a how student? does that process go around? So, oh, excuse me, as a as a physical therapist, I guess okay. as a student. Oh, I, also, yeah, I guess it could go either way. Because yeah. I can imagine it might be even more awkward if you're a student. Yeah. And you're seeing things. You know, yeah. I, I've gotten phone calls from some of my students in the past while they're out of film. Going, can you review that with me again? <laughs> and and you know, again, when I start to ask questions, then, then you know, they, they explain things. So uh, that's, a, that's good. That's what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a situation like that, especially as a student, I would say that you know, the first thing to do is, is just be sure of what you're seeing and making sure that you got it right. Uh, but then the first person to talk to is always your student. And, and just ask. And, and one way that I recommend, because I've had this question come up before, the, you know, again, you don't you don't want to make your CI mad or, or start sending the wrong signals here, start accusing everybody of fraud. Uh, that's not a good way to go. Uh, but just to say, sense. you know, I, I I had this class at, at school and, and we covered some of this stuff, and, and the way they covered it was a little different than the way you guys are doing it. So can you kind of go over this with me a little bit? That's a non-threatening way to to do that. You know, I've hired therapists that have come from other facilities, and and. And they start going to go over the billing procedures and everything. And they go, well, that's not how we used to do it. And we say, okay, well, that's fine. So we go over it and, and reconcile that. If you're if you've already graduated and you're in your first job, then again, that that again, that is a different situation than being a student as well. 
nobody wants to lose a job or that type of thing. So we just need to be careful how we how we question this stuff. But it, I essentially follow the same path and just say, you know, back in school or maybe a workshop that I went to or maybe when I went to a combined sections meeting for APTA, I went to this class and they went over the 23 minute rule and, and the way they taught it is different than the way we're doing it. You know, can, can you help me out here? Yeah. So that, that's, a, that's an appropriate way to go about asking that question. I think that's really good that you're giving us kind of tools for how to go about questioning some of these things in a non-threatening way because I think a lot of people get really nervous about how to approach right. this, this type because it's you know it's it's a sticky topic and it's definitely scary for right. for a lot of us especially if we're not entirely sure what is you know fraudulent versus right. you know, and, and the more that we do these types of discussions the, the more confident we'll be about right. those but I think that's right. well and and you, know, you want to be careful I've got a friend of mine who says well, you got to be careful when you say the F word it's fraud yeah uh, and, and you do. You, you need to be careful there. You don't want to be accusing people of things. Mm -hmm. when you, you might not have the whole story. So if, if you've got some concerns, then, then there are ways to ask that appropriately. And, and it, it, you know, who knows? It, it could be nothing or it could be something. Uh, it, it could go either way. So just be prepared for either one. But, but we need to be asking the question. And, and that's the big thing. We, we don't want to turn a blind eye. Because we are all individually liable for these types of things when they occur. You know, when, when you sign your name on that documentation, that's your name. When you input that billing into the billing system, and it's, it's tied to your name. That's you. So look, I, I just in-service my staff on all this stuff. We do this every two years. We just did one last Monday. And I tell them, you know, if something would happen here, they're not just going to go after me. They're also going to go after you because it's actually your name on the plan of care and on the billing. But they're going to go after them too, and, and who knows who knows who else. And this is true, especially in environments like, say, a private practice, where it's the therapist who's actually billing individually. You know, in a hospital setting, we're billing through the hospital NPI network. But in a, a private practice, you know, many times that's being billed out actually as the therapist. So, so it's even more so there. But as an individual license holder, no matter what setting we work in, we're all individually liable. And, and as, as a collective, as our profession, we're liable for it too. If Medicare is looking at PT or any other profession out there and, and thinking there's a lot of fraud in it, that's not good for us. That's going to affect our payment levels and the fee schedule and, and elsewhere. It's going to impact how we're audited and you know, how aggressive they are. So we don't want any of that. Well, this may be a big question to ask as we're starting to run out of time. Um, but I did want to ask just your opinion on, as we are seeing rapid and large changes in the healthcare climate with some of this more emphasis on paid performance, etc., what do you anticipate as seeing in terms of changes in how all of this is Pursues such as, as fraud and um, productivity standards, mm -hmm. etc. Do you what changes do you foresee given the current healthcare climate changes that are coming up? Yeah, uh, value-based purchasing, <laughs> pay for performance, pay for outcomes. Mm -hmm. It's all kind of the same thing there, just by different titles. I think that's going to be very interesting. Um, it, it's interesting some of the conversations I've been in over the years with this. Some people are very scared of this. And, and some people can't wait for it. And, and it just intuitively makes sense that we should be paid based on what outcomes we generate. In the past, we never could do that because we didn't have the data systems to inform the payers about how well patients were doing. And we're, we're, we're inching our way there with computerization and the like. You know, as technology continues to advance, it's going to get easier and easier. We're already being partially paid in, in the inpatient hospital setting for outcomes, uh, both the clinical outcomes and the patient satisfaction outcomes. I think that's something we can't forget is that outcomes doesn't just include the clinical outcome, but also the patient's perception of the care that they got via customer satisfaction service. So that is coming to the, the outpatient physician world, which we assume means that will then come to our outpatient clinics as well. It's coming to skilled nursing. It's, it's probably coming up in health. 
So we're, we're marching down that road, but we're, we're in the very, very early stages. But to your question, as far as how it's going to impact fraud and, and that type of thing, unfortunately, there's probably always going to be somebody out there who's going to try and game the system. So even if we go to that type of system, you know, it could be that you're inflating your outcomes or somehow changing the scores that the patients may get to make it look like you're achieving a higher level outcome than you really are. So that's just a new way of upcoding. So there's, there's still going to be ways to gain a system that, that we're going to have to be watchful for and, and to try and prevent. But I think on the whole, it's, it'll, be an interesting, it'll be an interesting world. The way I describe it to the students is, is imagine if I gave you a test and I posted your scores online on the internet with your names there so that everybody out there in the whole world can see your scores. And what I tell them is, is probably within five or ten years as physical therapists, that's going to be you out there and it's going to be your patient outcomes out there. And everybody's going to be able to see it. Uh, patients might choose you or not choose you based on your outcome. But I may not choose you, or I may choose you, as a hiring director as well. Because you can dang well bet I'm going to be going out there to look at what your outcomes are when, before you come in for the interview, or maybe even before I call you. So you know, that's the reality. And it's not going to be just us. That's going to be physicians. It's going to be hospitals. It's, it's going to be everything. But that is probably the future that we're marching toward. And, and we just need to be ready for that. It's not necessarily not saying it's getting anybody scared, just we just need to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. and, and this is all going to be public data for a while. And if you're a hospital administrator, they'll look at you and go, it's already public. All of all of my stuff as the hospital, that's all that's out there. And so it's coming. And mm -hmm. you can actually go ahead, you can find some individual physical therapist data on the Medicare Compare website right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's not very much, but you are starting to see some some people listed out there. Yeah. It's coming. Watch out. Well, any other final remarks that you have for Kim that you'd like to closing remarks that you'd like to leave future students with in terms of? Well, I would say you know I, I get it. So people are listening to this, going you know, gosh, you know I gotta learn all this stuff. Um, what, what I always again tell the students is you know if you're thinking of getting into management or or opening your own clinic one day or or something like that, yeah, you're gonna have to learn a little more about this stuff. So just be prepared and get ready to do that. But if you're not looking to do those things, if you're looking to be a, a, a clinician, you're looking to maybe specialize in a, in a clinical area and all that, you, know, you don't have to be an expert in this stuff. But you need to be aware of it. And you need to know that it's out there. So my recommendation is, is you know, once you graduate, because again, chances are you've had some of this in your curriculum, is you run the risk of then just losing touch with this. So what I recommend is, is in your state, because chances are your state chapter is going to host a, a conference, and they'll usually have a, a course or, or something about this type of material. Or especially if you go to an APTA conference, like combined sections meeting or the summer conference, which we call the next conference now, there's always programming about Medicare rules and regs and, and clients and all kinds of things like this. And then they're usually in two hour, maybe three hour blocks max. So it's not like you're going to have to spend three days there learning about this stuff. You can still spend most of your time learning about the, the clinical things you want to learn about. But go to one or two things about this stuff and stay aware because, again, you don't want to be driving down the street and not be able to not know what's coming at you from either side. So just maintain your awareness. Don't have to be an expert, but, but just maintain your awareness. So that would be my advice. Well, we appreciate an expert like you coming to share your knowledge yeah, with well, us tonight. Appreciate you having me. And, uh, we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for tuning in tonight for this week's DPT student chat. Uh, my name's Laura, and I'm with Mark Dwyer of Olathe Medical Center. Thank you very much for yeah. joining us. I wish you all the best in your careers. Can't wait to see you out there at the APT conference. Thank you. Sure. Have a great night.